Hello and welcome back once again to the massive YouTube iceberg. Today we'll be continuing on with tier 7. Quick update, channel's been doing amazingly. Thank you for all your support. Couldn't do without you guys. Like, for real, getting 60,000 views on the last video was something I didn't even think was possible. But from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And also, before we get started, I'm happy to announce that this video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. When you're poking around in the deepest recesses of the internet, you're actually quite vulnerable to hackers stealing your data from many sources even if you are just on YouTube. That's what Atlas VPN is here to protect against. Atlas VPN is actually the best deal on the VPN market, as it's quite affordable at only $1.70 a month, plus six months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so long as you use the code in the description. Not only can you protect your privacy with this ridiculously low price, but you will also get all the added benefits of Atlas VPN. This includes things like built-in ad blocks, so you don't have to get assaulted by malicious links and explicit advertisements like every time you go on any website. Another cool features that you can unlock all the content that shows up on foreign countries Netflix or Hulu or what have you, and even YouTube, as there's quite a lot of content that isn't allowed in certain countries, as I mentioned all the way back in tier 1. German viewers, I'm, I'm looking at you, you guys are missing out on the whole like 3% of all of YouTube. Atlas VPN also lets you save money while shopping as there are certain deals only available in foreign countries, and it lets you protect your web searches without having it be tracked. Once again, use the link in the description or on screen to get Atlas VPN Premium for $1.70 a month plus 6 months entry with a 30 day money back guarantee. Thank you to Atlas VPN. VPN for sponsoring this video, and thank you, the viewer, for not skipping this ad. You, you, you didn't skip the ad, right? Operation YouTube was a campaign conducted in mid-2009 by Anonymous, which in 2009 basically just meant a bunch of trolls united under one cause. According to Encyclopedia Dramatica, which, I mean, grain of salt, but still, it started on the E-Bombs World forums in May, more specifically the porn board. One curious member asked, what happens if you post pornography to YouTube? Obviously, many forum members' responses were, it gets removed, duh. However, the conversation kept going, and the question shifted to what happens when you post pornography to YouTube to what happens when we post pornography to YouTube. As in, what would happen if there was a coordinated attack where all the members of the forum began posting NSFW content to the site. YouTube was still in its infancy and there was no way its content moderation was powerful enough to ban everyone. And so, the date was set. Operation YouTube was conducted on May 20th, 2009 by Ebombs World Forum members in collaboration with Anons from B and lasted the whole 24 hours. Participants would register new accounts, upload porn, and tag them with marble cake for easy searching, which Kinda seems like a dumb idea to me, because it would just make it easier for staff to delete it. No, take your cursor off the search bar, it doesn't work anymore. People would, in order for the videos to spread as far as possible, attach other tags of popular search terms, such as Twilight, Jonas Brothers, Hannah Montana, High School Musical, Fred, Britain's Got Talent, and The Swine Flu, which is possibly the most 2009 combination of keywords ever conceived. Trolls would also mass flag innocent videos in order to confuse moderators. The campaign was a huge controversy and was reported on by major news outlets such as The Guardian, The Independent, and The BBC. The BBC report in particular read out one of the comments on a video titled Jonas Brothers Live on Stage that said, I'm 12 years old, and what is this? This would become a popular phrase on the internet over the course of the next couple years, where people would say it in response to anything strange or vulgar, or just confusion. A few months later, in January 2010, a second wave of spam would be conducted, apparently in retaliation of Google's suspension of Lukey West 1234 an 8-year-old YouTuber who honestly could be his own honorable mention. In fact, there are a lot of second waves, like the June 12th, 2009, Operation Ponytail. However, over time, these efforts became progressively less successful as Google improved its content moderation algorithms. Eventually, Operation YouTube faded into obscurity, forgotten by most and consigned to the annals of internet history, much like May Aids, an episode that has largely faded from collective memory. Moonman is a nickname given to the iconic late 1980s McDonald's mascot, Mac Tonight. More specifically, certain depictions of him that paint him as a less than ideal representative for the company. It started on YTMND.com, where people began pairing GIFs of Mac Tonight commercials alongside less than appropriate audio files. First, the ever so popular and fairly innocent Chacaron Macaron, but later users would begin using text to speech voices to make him say quite offensive things, like chanting the letters KKK over and over again 
again, spouting racial slurs, and soon enough, song parodies that swapped lyrics for advocacy for racially charged violent crimes, as well as other things like elder abuse and mass murder. And that's around the time he gained the nickname Moon Man. The group of people that would make these edits would soon become known as the Moon Crew, and they wanted to spread their meme. So they took to YouTube, of course, and began re-uploading certain songs like Notorious KKK, a parody of Hypnotized by Notorious B.I.G., and uploading songs like Moon Man Origins, which explained the lore of the character they created. YouTube would begin consistently removing any video featuring Moon Man as it violated their guidelines on racism and inciting violence. This content was also met with copyright strikes from McDonald's, and AT&T, the company that owned the Texas speech bot, banned the phrase from use on their services. That being said, outside of a few instances, Moon Man was still contained to mostly YTMND. In 2014, the vaporwave artist St. Pepsi released Enjoy Yourself, which featured Max Knight prominently in the music video. Finally, he wasn't associated with the Moon Man persona in people's minds. This association with vaporwave lasted less than a year before the Moon Man raps began spreading far past the breaches of YTMND in 2015 and 2016. Perhaps as a byproduct of the rise of the alt-right movement in the 2016 election, Moon Man would swiftly resurge in popularity. A whole new generation only knew this iconic advertising mascot as nothing more than an edgy, racist, alt-right, slur-spouting rapper, who began to function more as a mascot for 4chan's poll board than McDonald's. I myself have even personally met people who only know this character character's name is Moon Man. Moon Man would then be supported by places like the neo-Nazi news site InfoStormer and a We Searcher campaign to put up Moon Man themed billboards in support of Donald Trump. While it's debatable whether or not the original posters actually shared the views of their creation or if they were just being edgy, Moon Man quickly spiraled out of control and in 2019 landed itself an official spot as a hate symbol on the Anti-Defamation League website. But you know, it was all a joke, so... Era Dixie was a somewhat popular Canadian Call of Duty player who would upload videos of himself performing trick shots in the early 2010s, which was when that style of content was at its peak popularity. In 2014, however, he disappeared from the internet randomly without any prior warning. We didn't know a whole lot about his personal life, but we did know what he looked like, his first name, being Muhammad, and his city, Hamilton, which is a fairly populous city in Ontario. These three dots wouldn't be connected until content creator VKs uploaded a video to Twitter explaining that he possibly had ties to ISIS. Yeah, in the video, he digs up a news article from around the time he disappeared from the CBC. The headline read, Mohammed Mohammed Mohammed, Hamilton youth reported killed as ISIS fighter. According to the article, Mohammed is radicalized online by Islamist extremists and joined the war on the side of the Islamic State. Articles even seem to mention that this Mohammed loved playing Call of Duty. It was pretty clear that Mohammed 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 was Dixie. The articles go further, saying he was a very extroverted and academically driven person, and generally had a pretty good life. However, he shut off contact with both his online presence and his friends when he became incredibly devout in his religion, dedicating himself to the point where he did what he did. While it's unknown what his fate was with ISIS, as they're not exactly known for publishing information and statistics like that, it's most likely he died shortly after he joined, since that's just kinda what ISIS members do. The news came as quite a shock to not only his family, but also his fellow teammates on ERA, and was definitely not what I was expecting to see. Rabies in a Human is a three and a half minute long video by the University of California that documents what happens when a human being contracts rabies, most likely as the result of being bitten by a fox or dog or raccoon or some other woodland critter. It's honestly really disturbing, not only from the subject matter, but also the creepy nightmare music they use in the background. For the unaware, rabies is a somewhat common disease in animals, however in humans it's extremely rare, with only about one or two cases per year in the United States, thanks to vaccines for both pets and sometimes humans, and also people just generally knowing not to fuck with wild animals. That being said, if a human does contract rabies, it is 99.9% .9 fatal as soon as the symptoms show up the highest mortality rate of virtually any disease on planet Earth, as there exists no proper treatment. Not only that, but it might be one of the most painful ways to die. Your body eventually starts rejecting any water you try to swallow, and then you start salivating continuously, which turns into foaming, and eventually you die from dehydration. The video shows every stage of this man's slow death in gruesome detail. Apparently, the man was given the choice of either being euthanized or just letting it slowly kill him, but he chose the latter in order to be studied for science, which honestly makes him a fucking hero, because if that was me, I'd just take the needle. 
Dog Sees Ghost is a video uploaded in 2007 by YouTube user Cy Jarvis. It's a classic paranormal video where the uploader is trying to lead his dog, Annie, through a hallway in order to feed her. However, she seems to be very scared of going through the hallway, looking at random places and even growling and barking, acting very unusual. And that really sums up this video's 7 minute runtime. Back in YouTube's infancy, these paranormal videos would attract a ridiculous amount of attention, possibly because viewers didn't have much to go off of and were easily impressed. Commenters from around the time the video is uploaded can be seen discussing how animals can see parts of the spiritual realm that we can't. It's kind of interesting to look at, since comments like this wouldn't really exist in this day and age, since most internet goers are so jaded by false information. Nevertheless, the most obvious likely explanation is that the dog is just weird. Anyone who's had a pet dog most likely knows what I'm talking about. Personally, my family has owned a couple of dogs and they'll just get terrified and start barking at the top of their lungs for literally no reason in the middle of the night. Or maybe my house is just haunted too, I don't know. 132 Insert 132 was a horror web series slash ARG that ran from 2015 to 2016, and to be completely honest, was pretty run of the mill. Grayscale footage takes place in the woods, hooded figures, strange symbols, and even has direct references to things like the Blair Witch Project, which basically inspired every single one of these that look like this. I believe the gimmick with this one is that the footage in the series are reenactments of events that happened in universe rather than the actual events themselves. Again, not really my thing, but there's a Nightmind video to check out if you're interested. Chasen Rance is an American professional wrestler and wrestling trainer who debuted in 1999, and I guess has a YouTube channel. I'm by no means a wrestling fan, but to me it doesn't really seem like he did anything of note in the professional wrestling field, at least from what I can gather. However, in 2011 he was arrested on account of events that happened in 2008. Chase and Rance had had sexual relations and battery with a minor, who was between the ages of 12 and 15. In 2014, he was officially added to the sex offender registry, which, if you don't know, is permanent. You would think that he would never show up in any sort of professional setting again after this news. However, that would not be the case. He came back to wrestling a mere seven months later. And you know where he went after that? He went back to Team Vision Dojo, a wrestling school in Orlando, Florida, that Chazen founded in 2002, that specializes in teaching children under the age of 18 to wrestle. Obviously, this led to a lot of backlash, which led to a statement from the school. According to them, Chazen went to therapy and submitted drug testing, and did everything that was required of him by law. And then he went back to training minors. But don't worry guys, he always tells parents about how he was previously convicted, so that makes it alright. The parents consent to it. Hell, apparently at one point the dojo allowed Chazen to tag team with a 16 year old girl. Which, of course, it would make sense that the dojo would be okay with that, considering he owns the dojo. Technically, he's not bound by law from doing this, it's just obviously really fucking weird. To tie this back to YouTube, he upholds a YouTube channel that he consistently uploads to, and his latest video was 8 days ago as of writing the script, seemingly unfazed by the fact that he's a sex offender. Samantha Wolford is a woman from Titus County, Texas, who lived with her five kids and her husband, Ernie Ibarra. Her videos are, for the most part, vlogs where she just talks about her day and stuff like that. You know, pretty standard shit. Apparently, she'd upload quite a bit, treating it as her full-time job, despite having a very small audience, while her husband would work two jobs and be the only source of income for the both of them and her kids. While her videos began talking about small things like makeup tutorials and rambling about pop culture and things like that, she soon began shedding shedding light on very personal things, like how a relationship is going with her spouse and her family. She had quite the uneasy relationship with her husband as time went on, and she would even tell her friends that he abused her physically and emotionally. However, it's up in the air whether that was actually true. In 2015, tragedy struck. Samantha's mother called 911 in the late hours of the night, claiming that the mysterious intruders had broken into their house pistol whipped her husband Ernie, and then kidnapped him. Meanwhile, Samantha had been tied up and gagged, and somehow managed to call her mother while doing so, who probably called 911. Police took Samantha in for an investigation, and she revealed the names of the three men who took Ernie away, being Jonathan Sanford, Octavius Rhymes, and Jose Pons. However, based on a slip-up in the interview where Samantha tried to explain how she called her mom, investigators realized that the true mastermind of the operation was Samantha herself, and she collaborated with the three men in order to murder Ernie Ibarra. She was arrested along with the three other men, and they all served life sentences. Yeah, it's honestly kind of a crazy turn of events. 
The fact that this entry comes right after Samantha Wolford might be the most jarring tone shift in the entire iceberg, at least so far. Poop Shotgun is a short YouTube video where a guy runs into the bathroom while his friend is on the toilet. He hands him a can of beer and yells, Poop Shotgun. The friend then shotguns the beer and gets her from the seat a little bit, and then, well, poops, which leaves his ass at a high speed, resulting in a shotgun-like effect. The video is pretty short, basically being a vine, and there's really not much else to it. The original upload was deleted, so I couldn't tell you who originally posted this and when, but I feel like it isn't really super important. Talking Turd Abomination Animation is a video by YouTube user Squirrel with a Gun uploaded in 2007. It was made to test out lip syncing with Lightwave 8 and features this abomination talking rather politely about how he can eat a baby in one bite. But of course, he wouldn't because he prefers to chew his food. And that's pretty much all there is to this. A theory I have is that he's related to Yelling Creature. Discover the most pleasurable way to poop is the name of an advertisement from Squatty Potty, a toilet that's designed for users to squat when they poop instead of sitting, since our bodies are actually designed for doing it that way. Okay, well actually it's not even a toilet, it's just a fucking stool. The commercial is fantasy themed and shows a mermaid, a centaur, and a dragon having some problems shitting. Why is this on here? I really have no idea. I'm gonna assume this is most likely aired as a YouTube ad at one point. People got pissed after having to watch a baby dragon poop every time they watch a video and that's why it's memorable. Or Potted Plant just thought it was really funny, which honestly describes more and more entries as we go down. Brian Joseph Ricard, better known by his internet alias Yote Slayer, was a gaming YouTuber who primarily did videos focusing around Call of Duty and Borderlands, and would sometimes do other games too. Pretty standard channel, all things considered, and he was active from 2007 to 2013. However, in 2013, Brian was driving two of his friends around his home county in Indiana. At a train crossing, he had the bright idea of trying to outrun it instead of just waiting. The train did not stop for him, killing him and his two passengers instantly, breaking the heart of his friends, family, and fans. It's worth mentioning that I couldn't find a reliable source on whether this was actually him behind the wheel or one of his friends, but news reports did say that there was most likely alcohol involved, which makes sense because I don't think anyone in their right mind would try to do something like that. Innocence of Muslims is an extremely controversial short film directed, written, and produced by Egyptian-American and Coptic Christian filmmaker Nikula Paseli Nikula. The film is controversial due to its criticisms of Islam and the Islamic prophet Muhammad, and it was originally uploaded to YouTube by Nikula himself under the pseudonym Sam Basil. It has a really interesting history, actually. The film's vision, initially, was fairly unpolitical. The original name was Desert Warrior and described life 2,000 years in the past, and featured a man called Master George, who was portrayed as, according to New York Times, a buffoon, a womanizer, a child molester, a child of uncertain parentage, a greedy, bloodthirsty thug, and a homosexual, which that one's obviously not that bad, but... I guess you're not allowed to do that in Islam. Actors were called in to portray roles in the film, and it seemed like a pretty standard, albeit low-budget, bad film. The film was first screened in the Vine Theater in California to an audience of about 10 people. However, the finished product was quite different than what Nikula actually led on in the production. Nikula actually had some of the voice work dubbed over in order to push forward an anti-Islamic sentiment, specifically changing the name of Master George to Muhammad, as he now was meant to represent the famous prophet. The actors, some of whom were Muslims themselves, and some of them weren't, were never consulted about the redubbing. A non-profit organization called Media for Christ were the ones who provided Nikula with the film permits, however they did so for Desert Warrior, and not the edited version, Innocence of Muslims. So all this dishonesty from the film producer, along with the general message of the film, must have led to some pretty huge backlash, right? Uh, yeah. A 13-minute trailer was posted to YouTube in 2012. However, I couldn't find anything about the full film being found, and it possibly doesn't exist entirely. However, this YouTube upload is where it began spreading internationally, especially to Arabic countries. They really, really did not like it, and were somehow led under the false pretense that the innocence of Muslims was a Hollywood blockbuster and represents the views of the American people and even the American government. This led to infamously widespread protests across Northern Africa and the Middle East from enraged Muslims thinking the Americans believed Muhammad was a piece of shit, even though it was just one guy who was really shady and probably just doing it to stir up shit. Riots were held, especially against the United States embassies in these countries. Most famous of these were Egypt and Libya, the latter of which you 
may be familiar with as the 2012 Benghazi attack, you know, the same one the Hillary Clinton emails thing centered around. This attack was coordinated on September 11th of all days, 2012, against the American Embassy in Benghazi, Libya, and led to the death of multiple American officials such as United States Ambassador J. Christopher Stevens and U.S. Foreign Service Officer Sean Smith. All of this over a comically poorly made film shown to an audience of like 10 people, directed by a sleazy Hollywood con man. So what happened to Nikula Baseli Nikula after the backlash? Well, he was arrested by U.S. law officials for violating his terms of probation, including but not limited to using aliases or the internet without approval from the probation officer beforehand. Yeah, unsurprisingly, this isn't the first time this guy has had run-ins with the law, since in the 90s, he was a meth dealer, and in 2012, just two years before the release of the film, he was arrested on account of bank fraud. Yeah, man, you read that right. George Floyd Gaming, can't believe I'm saying that, is a channel started in, well, 2020, obviously. All the videos on the channel are just Fortnite clips alongside other games sometimes with this image of George Floyd in the top left, edited to be wearing a gamer headset. The audio for every video is Wishing Well by Juice World, which the joke is immediately apparent once you listen to that song's lyrics. There's not really a whole lot to this, it's probably just some teenager trying to be edgy. A similar channel would be Pedophile Gaming, which to my knowledge is really just a standard commentary channel ran by a 16 year old, and the name was just a name. Honestly, that's a much funnier use of shock value to me. I'm sure you're all familiar with the classic YouTube play button, a reward given out to YouTubers upon hitting subscriber milestones, such as 100k, a million, 10 million, so on and so forth. These were rolled out around 2013, however back then the silver play button didn't exist, and instead channels were sent a YouTube branded camera bag and a $50 gift card upon hitting the big 100k. Pretty neat, but for those who hated bags I guess, the option was provided to instead have a director's share that looked like this. Now, you might immediately realize a problem with the chair, which is that it fucking sucks. Like, first of all, it looks so uncomfortable to sit on and so small. I also don't really see how much use this would get because I feel like most YouTube videos are a lot more casual than that. I can't really see a case where you would want these three metal rods poking at your ass cheeks instead of sitting on like, you know, an actual chair. I don't even think I would want to be sitting on this if I was directing a movie. And most of all, this isn't even a director's chair. It was called that and marketed as that, but this is a director's chair. I don't know if YouTube just forgot what a director's chair looked like or wanted a low budget alternative since they were giving these out for free. Needless to say, almost everyone picked the bag because it was a pretty good bag, making the chair quite a rare commodity. One of the few people to have one, Tamashi Hiroka, said on the tweet that she foolishly picked the chair, expecting it to be, you know, an actual director's chair, and they sent her two for some reason. Honestly, if I had 100k subs in 2013 and they started rolling out silver play buttons a year later and I just couldn't get one, I'd be so pissed. Elephant Man is a video uploaded in 2007 by YouTube user Elpito and features a severely deformed man in a Chinese hospital. The man's name is Huang Chunkai, and he had an extreme, extreme case of rare genetic disorder called neurofibromatosis, which is what causes tumors to grow on people's skin. It usually isn't this bad, however, this guy got unlucky and has these giant tumors growing out of maybe the worst possible place, the face. As a result, his facial features were completely distorted. This earned him the nickname China's Elephant Man, in reference to Joseph Merrick, an Englishman who earned the title The Elephant Man at freak shows, thanks to his similarly severe deformities. In 2007, Huang received surgery to remove the tumor on his face from the Fuda Cancer Hospital, which is what this video depicts. Over the years, he would receive more and more surgeries, which most likely prevented him from dying early, but he still lives to this day with the deformities. According to news reports from 2017, he's been more accustomed to his appearance and leads a fairly normal life. Of course, he has received several monetary offers to appear in circus freak shows, much like his 19th century predecessor, but he has repeatedly turned them down, most likely not wanting to have people profit off of his unfortunate situation. Spooky Haunted Puppet That Choked Owner Caught Moving on Camera in a Sealed Container is a video uploaded by Minhas TV 2 in 2015, which has since been deleted and re-uploaded. The title is so damn long that it pretty much does my job for me. 
The backstory is that this puppet supposedly almost killed its previous owner by strangling them in the dead of night somehow. The owner sent in the puppet to paranormal investigator Jane Harris, who had apparently been investigating spiritual attachment to haunted puppets for 17 years. Oh, there's a major for anything nowadays, I guess. She locked it in a glass container and filmed it. We can see here that it's clearly moving, with the operating cross slowly moving upright before moving back down. All of this comes from a Daily Mail article, which constantly reiterates that there's no possible way for this to be fake. But if you look at the video, it just kind of looks like gravity taking its place, and they never actually show it moving back up. So yeah, another most likely fake ghost video. Although, then again, it does say Real Thing TV <laughs> right there, so I guess it is real. Reptile Channel is a bit of a strange rabbit hole. It's, as you might guess from the name, a channel that centers around reptiles. At first glance, it presents itself as an educational, somewhat family-friendly channel that teaches its audience about reptiles and their feeding behaviors and whatnot. However, more observant viewers will notice a very concerning amount of videos related to giant snakes and lizards eating and constricting smaller, more defenseless animals, sometimes even infants. Nearly every single one of their videos revolves around reptiles eating something. And these aren't done in the wild, but rather in enclosed spaces that whoever is running the channel created for those animals to be eaten in. Like an anaconda doesn't just waltz and right into a coop of baby chickens with a camera right in its face, right? No, it doesn't. While they have a cover story of wanting to educate about science, it's clear whoever is running this channel must have a reason to have this style of content focused, even going as far as to abuse animals to get to produce their content. Well, there actually is a reason, although it's far from a justified one. This channel is thought to be spearheaded by an individual who goes by Jonah Vor, who is a Vor fetishist, i.e. someone who gets sexual pleasure from the idea of something or someone smaller being eaten by someone or something larger. Most people have this fetish are only attracted to the idea in fiction, however Jonah is different, clearly. He's been active on the internet for quite some time, as a matter of fact, with an old YouTube channel dating back to 2007 that was soon as removed for violating guidelines. How we know it was specifically him is that he advertised it on the... Big Gulp message boards, a form for discussing Vor. He advertised it as an RL Vor channel, and that some of you may remember them, winky face. And yeah, it's true. There were now deleted videos on the Reptile channel that are identical to the ones posted on Jonah Vor's website. There's also other things like the channel's Patreon banner featuring a hyper realistic drawing of a man getting eaten by a giant lizard. So yeah, this channel is run by a Vor fetishist that abuses animals for sexual gratification. The strangest part is that this channel is still up to this day, although they haven't uploaded the video in years. It would seem like they were exposed by nerd New England reptile distributors, which stirred up some controversy in the reptile community for a bit. I'd imagine being one of these reptile channels and having a channel called The Reptile Channel be like this must suck ass. Ricard Siajan was an Indonesian tattoo artist and loving father who ran a YouTube channel that uploaded videos detailing his life, showing him drawing, giving people tattoos, and playing with his son. However, in late 2015, Ricard moved to the United States in order to pursue a higher paying career. It was around this time, though, that Ricard would contract a urinary tract infection. His boss, eager for him to get back to working, gave him a bottle of antibiotics which were supposed to help with the illness. He started showing immediate negative side effects, especially a near-complete inability to sleep. He would be diagnosed with an incredibly rare medical condition called fatal familial insomnia. This disease makes it so those afflicted will lose more and more sleep to the point where they'll die of exhaustion. Ricard's videos around this time are honestly terrifying to tell the truth, as he can be seen begging everyone and anyone to help him, as he slowly loses his mind to the delirium associated with the condition. Since Ricard didn't have insurance and didn't have enough money to treat his insomnia, he would slowly but surely march towards his death. In December 2016, he passed away from his illness. Trevor Heatman, better known by his YouTube alias McSkillet, was a gaming YouTuber who uploaded videos about Counter-Strike Global Offensive, more specifically gambling for more expensive skins in the game. At his peak, he made over $4 million from the business, and nearly a million subscribers on YouTube. He even had his own CSGO gambling site called CSGO Magic. However, as you might know, in 2018 there was a lot of controversy surrounding loot boxes and gambling sites like this. People were calling for these kinds of channels and websites to be banned, and in that same year, Valve updated their policies and began cracking down on these websites. Eventually, his site was a part of those that had fallen. Not only that, but his in-game inventory, worth around $100,000 to $200,000, was wiped. After this, McSkillet retired from YouTube and went dark on every social media platform. He didn't really have anything left after this, as his company had fallen and his main source of income had fallen too. I mean, he still had 900,000 subscribers, he could have just shipped focus, but you know, whatever. 
However, over the next couple of months, his mental state would begin deteriorating, to the point where his parents would ask law enforcement to take him in for psychological evaluation, which they refused to do. On August 23rd, 2018, Trevor Heatman took his own life in a quite selfish way. While on the highway, he drove onto oncoming traffic, colliding with a mother named Ariana Pizarro and her 12-year-old daughter, Eileen. He was not under the influence and was clearly doing this with intent, as there seemed to be no effort to swerve out of the way. He might be one of the only YouTubers to have taken their own life that people don't really have a lot of sympathy for, and his legacy will remain forever as one of the most hated figures in Counter-Strike history. Brooke Houts was a pretty popular vlogger with over 300,000 subscribers. Her videos were about what you'd expect, basically just talking about shit that goes on in their life, alongside the occasional makeup tutorial. However, what gained her notoriety, thrown to tier 7 of the iceberg, is her videos featuring her dog, Sphinx. Sphinx is a very energetic animal, one which would require a lot of effort and care to take care of. For a while, it seemed like she was doing a pretty good job of that, featuring him in her videos and the dog seeming fairly happy. However, in one video featuring Sphinx, she accidentally lets the facade slip. She can be seen grabbing him, slamming him on the ground, and yelling at him out of frustration. In this clip, she puts on a persona that is significantly different than the rest of the video, and afterwards she just goes back to her cheery vlogging personality. It's clear this was part of the video she forgot to edit out. She quickly realized her mistake, removing the video as soon as she could, but the damage was already done. She was public enemy number one, with her rapidly losing subscribers and even media outlets reporting on the event. Over the next couple of months, she would try to publish several apologies where she did not own up to her mistakes, stating that she was in a bad mood that day and really stressed out, and also that Sphinx was never hurt, which I can't show that clip here because it violates TOS, but that dog was definitely hurt when she did that. While she was never charged with anything really, and YouTube never took her channel down, she did eventually shut it down herself, and give Sphinx away to a friend who was more prepared to deal with him. Nowadays, we don't know where she is, as every single one of her social media accounts has been shut down by her. Types of Schizophrenia, A Day in the Life of, is a video uploaded to YouTube by Anon B in 2011, although the original creator of the video is Johnson Pharmaceuticals. It's six and a half minutes long and is meant to be a simulation of a perspective of a patient with schizophrenia having a psychotic episode. We can see our protagonist waking up in the morning and walking around their house with voices both male and female whispering in their head about how worthless and pathetic they are. They walk into their living room and turn on the TV, where the news reporter begins speaking directly to them about how they're useless and sit around all day and do nothing. Then a Pizza gets delivered to the house and they look at it and it's all bubbly and gross looking, so they throw it on the ground. Then finally their wife comes home and tells them to take their meds. The whole thing is meant to heighten awareness of schizophrenia so people can better understand what they go through on a day-to-day -day basis, and from the comments it seems people generally think they did a good job. Candle Cove is a creepypasta by Chris Staub. It centers around the eponymous children's television series Candle Cove that was apparently a puppet show that would progressively get more disturbing to viewers as it progressed. The story is laid out like an exchange on a web forum where users discuss watching the show in their childhood on a strange TV channel called Local 58. No, that's not a coincidence. The web series Local 58 is actually a spinoff of Candle Cove. The users recount elements of the show such as a skeleton pirate character called the Skin Taker, who wears a suit made out of, well, skin, and an episode which was literally just the puppets flailing around while screaming noises played. The latter got a recreation on YouTube in 2009 by a guy named Joe Jacob 666 This is one of those old videos that, while it was definitely probably scary in its time period, now it just kind of seems like a meme or something. There's also another recreation of it produced by the Sci-Fi Channel in 2016, as the whole series got an official adaptation as season one of their anthology series, Channel Zero. Begotten is an entry I've technically already covered. It's a film released in 1989, even though the video says 1990. It was directed by Edmund Elias Marriage. Back in Tier 5, we talked about Sujijijis, which was a video released in 2008 on YouTube that is merely a clip from Begotten, and in that entry, I discussed the plot of the film. It features a godlike feature taking their own life by disembowelment with a straight razor, which gives birth to Mother Earth and the Son of Earth, who's this deformed, half-human, half-monster creature, and together they embark on a journey through a desolate landscape. There really isn't a whole lot to say about it that I haven't already said. It's always listed under the most disturbing movies of all time lists. However, every actual review of it says it's kind of boring. Which, I mean, I apologize to any Begotten fans watching this, I haven't actually watched the entire film, but that's the general sentiment I'm observing. Also, I noticed last time I talked about this, it said it was an inspiration for David Lynch, but what I think I meant is that Begotten was inspired by David Lynch, not the other way around. So, oops.
This is another one of those entries that's a follow-up to a previous entry I've already talked about. Back in Tier 4, I talked about an old video called Grave Robbing for Morons, which was, to recap, an obscure VHS tape released in the late 1980s to early 1990s, and featured a young man explaining the most optimal way to rob graves. Some say it's fake, others say it's real, but it was released on an unmarked, uncredited VHS tape. So, how did people find out about this video's existence, though? Well, because it was uploaded to YouTube in 2014. But the reason why the uploader of that video found out about it is because it's featured in a slightly less obscure compilation DVD, released in most likely the mid to late 2000s based on just the general aesthetic of the box art in the main menu. It's called Ensuring Your Place in Hell, and Grave Robbing for Morons just one clip out of four on this DVD. The other three are about the same level of fucked up. First, there's one called Exploding Varmints, where a man who identifies himself as Lewis teaches the viewer how to, well, explode varmints, mostly gophers and prairie dogs, by shooting them with a high enough caliber that it looks like they blow up. Apparently, there's a rumor he did this in his neighbor's yard without permission, just casually sneaking onto his property and producing animal snuff films. Both Lewis and the DVD box make it clear that he's doing this almost strictly for fun. With the way these animals explode, I don't think they'd really be usable in any way. Next up is Cooking with Huck Botko, which is a series of shorts by a man named, well, Huck Botko. All of these shorts follow pretty much the same template. Huck describes how he hates somebody a lot, usually a family member, so he tricks them into eating something really, really gross. For example, in one short, he says he hates his dad. So he makes a fruitcake for him and then goes around to city asking random people to spit in the batter. They're then shown eating it and saying it tastes really good. In another short, he says he hates his sister a lot, so he contacts people with hepatitis and acquires blood samples for them. He then makes a cake and cooks the blood into it. He ends this short by showing himself giving it to her at one of her parties, and then everyone eats it, even her friends. Finally, there's one where he really hates his brother, so he bakes a pie for him. In this one, he hires male prostitutes to, you know, glaze it, and then he serves it to his brother. I wonder how his family hasn't caught on to how many gross-ass pies and cakes he makes for them. Well, that's because this one's fake. Hot Botko is actually a film director and writer, and he worked on The Last Exorcism, The Virginity Hit, and Mail Order Wife. None of which seemed like they were super well received, but, you know. He's also falsely credited on IMDb for writing a fake episode of Drama Alert, where Keemstar tries to revive his once popular TV show, but his wife leaves him, so he moves in with his uncle, played by Hulk Hogan. What the fuck? Anyways, last video on the DVD is Mortuary of the Dead, as opposed to Mortuary of the Live? Question mark? This video features three Spanish-speaking men breaking into a morgue. Along the way, they discovered mutilated bodies, severed heads, and even dead babies being preserved in glass jars. I saved this one for last because it's probably the most fucked up, and also the one we know the least about. It's either ridiculously well-done effects, or real probably the latter. All four of these clips are taken from VHS tapes from the 90s 90s, much like Grave Robbing for Morons. Following this, there's actually an Ensuring Your Place in Hell 2, released in 2021 by Putrid Productions, which is different than the original DVD. It features Four on the Floor, which is a real-life crime scene footage of the Wonderland murder case, an exorcism in Turkey, which is an exorcism in Turkey, High Impact Hand Safety, which is a training video that features corny and over-the-top scenes of gore, and finally, Experiments in the Revival of Organisms, which is also a video I talked about in Tier 6. Hell, there's even a third one, featuring an infant autopsy with a real baby corpse, a roadkill cooking tutorial, another work safety video, and another crime scene footage video. Almost all the videos on the trilogy are up on YouTube. Okay, maybe not the baby autopsy, but for the most part, they are. All in all, these tapes kinda remind me of Mondo films, except somehow even less tasteful. Abstractions is... <sighs> a horror web series slash ARG. Yay! Started in 2016, it's one of the more artsy and, dare I say, abstract ARGs we've seen on YouTube. The whole thing revolves around our main character dealing with themes of grief and loss relating to the passing of a family member. Of all the ARGs we've covered, I've gotta say it's certainly one of the more interesting ones, at least visually. I don't have a whole lot to say about the plot or anything, but there is a Nexpo video, so you already know what I'm gonna say.
The 15 Experience is another horror web series, this time being more of a found footage kind of deal. It began in 2014 on a channel of the same name. The premise was that one night a mysterious hacker was peering into private surveillance cameras in a random house. 15 to be exact, which is where the name comes from. However, suddenly he slowly realizes that there's evidence of paranormal activity going on in the house. The channel would upload several videos consisting of footage from each of the 15 cameras. However, the main show seemed like it was definitely the website, where users could click around at each of the surveillance cameras cameras running at the same time. That being said, the series abruptly ended later that same year. It came back in 2017, then abruptly stopped again, leaving the series unfinished to this day. Leighton Allen Laboot, better known by his internet alias Dolly Flesh, as well as alternate handles such as Misery Magic, was a channel on YouTube who was most well known for his main artistic medium, Claymation. Starting in 2016, he would begin uploading videos that started out pretty normal, just being animations with a fair bit of cartoon violence, however, nothing too crazy. As time would progress, though, his videos became a bit more disturbing. They would focus more and more on realistic depictions of murder, torture, dismemberment, genital mutilation, sexual assault, animal abuse, the list goes on and on. While Dolly Flesh is far from the first or last animator on YouTube to make gory animated videos, his were done on a level of realism that just weirded people out to an extreme degree. Even taking all that into consideration, it could just be chalked up to just edginess, right? Well, there's a character in these videos named Itchy the Clown who was directly based off John Wayne Gacy, a real-life serial killer who formerly had a job as a clown. John Wayne Gacy seems to be someone Leighton idolized as he would make tribute pieces to him as well as featuring Itchy in many of his videos. He also did some other weird things like making a clay sculpture of a baby and then began eating spaghetti out of its chest. Other times he would go into extreme detail on Twitter about his scat fetish. He even talked about how he would make sex dolls out of clay and then, you know, have sex with them in order to lose his virginity, which is something he desired quite a bit, as he was what some would consider an incel. At one point he made a clay sculpture of breasts for himself that were fully functional, even squirting out milk. So yeah, Leighton's a pretty weird guy. However, none of those were enough for him to lose his following, as he kind of built himself up upon being the weirdest and edgiest person on the internet possible. It wasn't until May of 2019 where he made a tweet talking about how he plans to buy some hamsters. A few days later, he films a video of himself playing with his three pet hamsters. The next day, Leighton would upload a video of himself torturing and killing the hamsters in gruesome and grotesque ways. He would stab them, amputate their limbs, drown them, crush them, and even microwave them. The video, titled one kid, three hamsters, was immediately taken down as it violated YouTube's terms of service. So he spread it elsewhere, cross-posting it to several unrelated subreddits. This would be the point where internet users would contact authorities, and on May 25th, 2020, Leighton was arrested on account of animal murder and abuse. However, only three days after his arrest, he was bailed out for a measly $1,000, and he was instead put on probation, where he would not be allowed to use social media or enter pet shops. At Leighton's hometown, there'd be a series of protests against his ridiculously light sentence, calling for him to be imprisoned. However, these were not successful, and Leighton, while again not permitted to use the internet, still roams free to this day. On YouTube, you can very easily find videos of mothers breastfeeding their babies. Obviously, YouTube doesn't allow you to show boobs in videos, but I assume this is a special case as breastfeeding isn't really a sexual thing and more of just like, you know, a natural thing. Like, you're literally allowed to do it in public. Most of the videos are educational too, and I assume it can't really dip into fetish story since they probably don't allow it if it's like an adult <laughs> sucking on someone's titties. Still though, it's pretty easy to find weird perverted comments on these videos, but beyond that, there's nothing super weird about these. Also, don't think I didn't notice that the breastfeeding entry came right after the Dolly Flesh entry. You know what you did, you fucking bastard. Alyssa DeVault is a woman from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and she apparently had a YouTube channel where she did makeup tutorials. At least that's what people say, however, to my knowledge, there exists absolutely no re-uploads of her content anywhere whatsoever. However, her content isn't the reason why she's listed on the iceberg. In 2017, she gave birth to a baby girl, and in 2018, she gave birth to a baby boy. Both the time she gave birth, she delivered the baby in her apartment, and would promptly be admitted to the hospital for all the things that came with childbirth, but no actual child to be seen. Apparently, she did not want kids, so instead of getting an abortion, what she would do is throw the baby's bodies in the dumpster outside her home. Yeah, she did this twice, and on the second time, authorities caught wind of it. She was sentenced to 40 years in prison without any chance of parole, and the last we heard of her, apparently she snuck drugs into prison and got punished for it. 
In 2015, a mining and metals company was created by the name of South32 straight out of Perth, Australia. Since its inception, it had garnered over $6 billion as of 2021, and was a spin-off of the larger company BHP Billiton. South32 is also the name of a film released in 2016, about a year after the company's creation. All things considered, not the greatest movie of all time. It was a low-budget indie flick that didn't get a lot of recognition, and when it did get recognition, it wasn't exactly the most well-received movie either, garnering a whopping 4 4.7 out of 10 average rating on IMDb. Hell, it's the kind of movie that is uploaded onto YouTube for free by the writer Luigi Bion. Luigi Bion is quite the character, to say the least, and even doing a quick Google search on him can tell you why. Though they've since been removed from the website, he has several biographies on IMDb written by what's most likely his alternative accounts, talking himself up to be some kind of savior for humanity, fighting against evil and villainy, and even claiming that in 2011 he was personally invited to meet with the Dalai Lama in India. At the same time, the biographies would allege things about South32, the unaffiliated mining company, saying that black employees would be discriminated against and that the CEO is a rapist, which are both, from what I can tell, completely baseless claims. The story gets weirder when people begin discovering a whole host of strange websites littered across the web. Satana.com, IHateKids.com, LosAngelesNews.com, etc, etc. What these all have in common is that they all feature images, videos, and sometimes even straight up redirections to South32. 32.com, Luigi Beyond's main website. Now, I don't think it can be understated how many websites this one dude runs. He owns around 70,000 domains across the internet, all of which are used for the purpose of promoting South32.com. At first, this website was merely used to promote the movie of the same name. However, as they started getting traction, the website would become rambly and chaotic. In 2018, a YouTuber by the name of Elders Vault uploaded a video diving down the rabbit hole, and the site changed to reflect that. South32 will pay $100,000 to locate the man who has Australian accent, calling himself Mr. Elder, and the company organization funding his false online campaigns against South32.com and its CEO Luigi Bion, International Motion Film Company. Apparently, there was no real follow-up to that, merely just being Luigi intimidating the YouTuber with his large sums of money. Searching South32 up on YouTube leads to a large amount of channels that all seem to be run by Luigi, with names such as South32, South32 Luigi Bion South32, South32 is a film business, Luigi Bion South32, etc, etc. So what does any of this mean? Is this just some meaningless bullshit? Perhaps even a promotional campaign for the film? Or even a front for criminal activity? Well, the main theory behind all of this that sort of makes everything make sense is that Luigi Beyond is a cyber squatter. The act of cyber squatting is intentionally registering a domain that a company could possibly want to use in the future. In doing so, you force the company to do whatever you want in order to get that domain, which in almost every case involves money. This was a ridiculously common practice in the early days of the internet, and even resulted in several court cases over domains like Nissan.com, Madonna.com, and even MikeRowSoft.com, the latter of which was owned by a high school student named Michael Rowe. It was a ridiculously easy way for people to make thousands of dollars, especially when there wasn't a lot of legislation surrounding it. So companies didn't really have any way to protect their copyright until, well, legislation was actually put into place in the early 2000s. So how is Luigi doing this in a time when the art of cyber squatting has been for the most part lost to time? Well, he has a movie, dude. A movie called South32 that just so happened to start production and pop up with a website around the time the mining company South32 would form. Now that I mention it, this isn't even really a theory. According to news reports, Luigi Bion is actually a pseudonym of Saeed Yamtabayan, who is a famous squatter who's been doing this for years, stealing domains from major companies such as 20th Century Fox, Bank of America, and Yahoo as far back as 2000. He faced legal repercussions for this, so he eventually changed his name and kept doing it, but this time he was clearly trying to be a bit more discreet about it. Shitting out a whole low-budget direct-to-YouTube movie to make it seem like he's promoting it rather than just trying to steal South32.com from the mining company. But don't worry, man. Yom Tobin said you can have your domain back for $10 million. The company's response was a simple lol fuck no and they went with south32.net instead. Yom Tobin, in a fit of rage, decided to publish random false allegations about the company's staff in order to blackmail them into buying the domain for his comically exorbitant price tag, as it would be the easiest way to get him to shut up. This never happened though, and all that we see is simply what's left of his desperate and frivolous attempts to extort money out of the company. Man, I've said South32 so many times I don't even feel like English anymore. And that's it for part two of tier seven of the massive YouTube iceberg. And uh, 
Holy shit, you guys, the last video got like 50,000 views. That's like way better than any of my videos have ever done. I also got like 2,000 subscribers in the past month too, so welcome new viewers and also thank you to returning viewers. Anyways, it would seem like my theory in the last video was pretty much right. Tier 7 onwards doesn't have any theming going on like the first half of the chart, so as we progress further down the chart, I could really find myself talking about anything, which is really exciting. The best part of doing this series is that I never really know what I'm going to be talking about, and that feeling is amplified the more we continue down. I'd never heard of South 32 before, but I was dreading talking about it, expecting to be nothing more than some dumb ARG, but was pleasantly surprised to find out it was much more interesting than that. Anyways, I don't have much to say beyond that. Join me next time when we finish up Tier 7. See ya.